Okay, we're now recording your presentation. All right, welcome everybody. As I said before, I gave this a couple, uh, couple of weeks, maybe a month ago to the Albany guys, and I have done it, I think, at NOVA in, in over the past years, but hopefully it'll be some help to everybody. Uh, recently, Chris and I judged the, uh, the RightCon contest, and it, it was really apparent that there's a huge difference in, in what people either understand about photographing models or are capable of doing. And I hope this helps you clear it up a little bit. Um, so first slide is title. Now, what are you gonna do with all these photos after you take them? Well, there's a whole bunch of different things you can do with them. Uh, if you like to write art articles for magazines, you really, gotta, you really gotta learn how to do good photos because they're getting more and more particular. For instance, um, fine scale modeler is the, 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 the most particular one I've come across yet that I've done, I've done pieces for. Uh, they want uh, in focus, a specific, a specific uh, form, uh, for, a formula for submitting the images. In other words, they want build, in progress build images along with a caption for each one. They don't want a, just a bunch of pictures that you describe in a text. So what you do is you wind up sending them a little bit of text, like background text about the subject. And then from then on, it's an individual picture showing where you put the parts together, where you sanded them, where you painted them, any detail you added. So it's really important for that. IPMS Journal uh, is uh, less particular. They do not pay, whereas Fine Scale does. Uh, scale air curve modeling, a little more particular, a little, little less than Fine Scale, but uh, still particular is how they want the photos formatted. And they do pay. And finally, the one that's not shown here is the IPMS UK Journal, and they do pay as well. So, uh, and they're, they're, you know, they're willing to take anything, but their quality is really high. So, uh, if you just like to have uh, photos of your models that, you, you know, you can archive, just put on a website or on your viewable on your cell phone or in Dropbox, or you want to go to magazine articles, that's why it's important to be able to take good photos. No. Uh, slideshow your work for a web page or portable device. If you put if you put them in place like Dropbox, you can get them. You can access them anywhere. Now, some people just like to have the record of the shows they attended. I know Aris is Aris has probably done every every show we've been to together for the last twenty five years. I don't do that. I don't do shows that much. But uh, if you just like to be able to look at all the models that were there, uh, if you look at the one in the photo on the upper right the uh, Liberty ship, that was at a model classic. And everybody, uh, I mean, I can't remember the builder's name, but it was, that model was just spectacular. And he knew how to photograph them too. So what makes a good model photo? And you see, you know, these, these are just some of the ones I've done. Uh, give, give you three different things, the figure, a tank and an aircraft, both the figure, the tank and the aircraft are 72nd scale, and so is the figure. What makes a good photo? Composition, focus, white balance, and correct lighting. I'm going to talk about all of them. Uh, and these elements of a good photo, they apply to every, every kind of photography you would do, whether it be landscapes or portraits. Uh, they're just, there's just different rules for each one. Obviously, I'm just going to cover um, uh, scale model photo photography here. I'm going to touch on one other aspect of it during the presentation that is really important for everything you do. So moving on, keeping your composure. That means the orientation of the subject against what's around it. Um, central composition, for instance, you usually want to make your main subject, the, the thing that, that draws people, people's eye the most. Uh, sometimes it works in the middle, sometimes it doesn't. For instance, a portrait very seldom, if you center the image, doesn't work real well. You wanna have it offset to one side 
So there's a place for the subject's eye to look where they're going. There's something called the rule of thirds. Now, most of you guys that are photographers, you have some experience in it. <coughs> Excuse me. You know what the rule of thirds is. Just imagine a tic-tac-toe board and you're trying to put your major point of interest where one of those lines crossed. Usually, this looks good to your eye. Now, I've tried to get an explanation out of a lot of different photographers why it looks good to your eye. Not once has somebody been able to tell me. The only thing I can, I can come up with on my own is that putting it on one of those points gives you an opportunity to have the subject or the main image looking towards that. Let's say if it was a, a deer in the woods, you can position it off to one side so the deer is looking where he's going. But that's the closest I can come to an explanation of why it looks good. Sometimes it just looks good. And sometimes putting it in the middle looks good. You, it, only your eye can tell you that. You gotta be the judge of it. So under control conditions. Under control conditions, I mean, if you got a little photo studio, even if it's really simple, like a, um, a table with a backdrop in your house, that's fine. Now, if you notice the Stuka on the left, it's centered. This is what you want for a model. You want, to, you want to keep your image centered, unless it's you're trying to depict some kind of model on a stand, an airplane on a stand where it's flying somewhere, then you may want to apply that rule of thirds. But in general, a model you want to center. You also want to have it take up as much as the, of, of the frame space as possible. So you'll notice the one here on the left, if you can see my, my cursor moving around, uh, that one I would consider well-placed. One on the right, not so much, of course. It's cutting off a wing. Um, lower, on the lower line, taking it a little higher angle. Again, it's centered, looking at it from a higher angle. The one on the right is taken from further away. It's almost the same aspect, but because it isn't filling the frame, it doesn't look as convincing. So that's what I mean by under control conditions, a good composition. Now, at shows, you haven't got much of a choice. Uh, the things are sitting on a table, usually with other models around it, you just got to give it your best shot. And this is just two examples of that. So you see the, the B-17 with things in the back and somebody else's hand, you can ask them to move their hand, they might. Uh, and the uh, seaplane on the bottom, same deal. You have the table cards there. Where are my eyeglasses? This is all about focus. Um, Obviously, everybody can see this is out of focus, right? That's not what you want. It's not your eyes. It's the focus on the camera. That's better. A little bit of my eyes. It's a little bit better. Now, if it's there are a lot of things you can fix in Photoshop and any of the other image editing software. If it's out of focus, it's out of focus. You're not, you're not going to fix that. Uh, sometimes there are sharpening tools for like, for instance, in Photoshop, there's a sharpening tool, but if you try to apply too much sharpening, the image is going to pixelate. So get if there's one thing you're going to concentrate on, on getting right out of the camera, it's focus. And I'm going to explain a little more about that. Most important part of element of focus is the depth of the field. How much of that image from front to back is in focus? Always use the smallest, which happens to be, it's a little bit uh, counterintuitive. Always use the smallest aperture lens opening, which turns out to be the largest number for the deepest depth of field. The smaller the aperture, the longer the shutter speed will be because it takes longer for the required amount of light to drink for the camera to drink it in through the lens, being the opening is smaller. And you're gonna see what I'm talking about here in a minute. Uh, unless you can, some general rules, unless your camera's on a tripod, any shutter speed. Now, now I'm not going to, I'm not writing this in stone because I've seen people that can hold, this, hold it steady at a 15th of a second. I can't do it. Uh, and as you get older, it's going to get tougher. Uh, my, my general rule of thumb is I don't try to handhold any, any, long, any uh, shorter than a 60th of a second. Uh, you hand, some of these cameras can compensate for that, sometimes, sometimes up to four times. Um, add four times the ability of the camera to steady itself. A lot of the newer cameras can do that. Um, but I try to not go handheld under than under 60 of a second. If it's on a tripod, 
that whole rule is out the window because it can, it, the lens can be open a minute. It doesn't make a difference. If you use a flash, also shutter speed is not usually an issue because your flash sync is at a 60th or a 250th of a second. So that's freezing the action. Again, at a model show, using a flash, don't need a tripod. If you are on a, sh on a tripod, of course, you you're on it because you, the shutter speed is going to be long. So use a cable or an infrared shutter release because if you try to have the camera on the tripod, press the shutter release, you're going to jiggle the camera and you're going to get blurred. Okay, be sure to use spot focus, single point. And again, you can find that in your camera's menu. Uh, if you can't find it, look at, the, at your, your uh, instruction manual. If you try to use autofocus, sometimes the camera will pick up the right part of the image and focus on it. Sometimes it may not. So set your camera on spot focus so it, it's forcing the camera to focus on the model and not maybe the model behind it or the surrounding area. Uh, look, considering that the model is now placed fully in your frame, put that focus point one third into the depth of the image. If you, in other words, if you were looking at a, an airplane where the, the left wing is in the lower, lower right corner and the right wing is in the upper left corner, you'd want to go somewhere around the wing root where it meets the fuselage. And re I'll show you that the reason why in a minute. Uh, most cameras, when you're using spot focus, the focus point, usually, I say usually because most all cameras are not the same, focus point usually becomes the metering point. So let's say you're photographing that Stuka I had in the earlier photo against a white background. You're gonna be metering the exposure of the Stuka, not the white background. Wanna be very careful of that. If you try to, uh, if you meter the white background, for instance, the Stuka will come out really, really dark. Okay, here's what happens. At a small f, f aperture, uh, no, F5, well, in this example, I'm saying F4. That means it's a very large lens opening. And I focus, as you can see the arrow, blue arrow, right where I explained in my last slide. This is what happens. You get a shallow depth of field, okay? Right here is in focus, because that's where my focus point was. The back end of the airplane and the nose are both out of focus. Now, if you go down to a smaller aperture, F22, that may be a little extreme. You could go F20, 22s, even 18. Look what happens there. Your focus point is exactly the same. It's in focus there. Now look at the tail, the wingtip, the nose. They're all in focus. So that's what that's the difference in the, in the aperture and what it gets you. So for model photography, Again, there's different rules for different kinds of photography. For, for model photography, I would recommend anywhere upwards of F18. Small lens open. This is in general, this, this slide doesn't deal so much with, with an actual, seeing an actual model, but it gives an example of you were photographing a landscape and the, the aperture you want to use. Here's a photographer. There's his subject. Here's a tree in the foreground and mountains in the way distance, which infinity, subject, and foreground. At F16, focus, focusing right there, okay, you're going to get not only, as you can see the bar, the bar graph right here, it's going to be in focus for the entire depth of the image. Uh, F16, because if you're photographing the outside, there's a, there's a rule called sunny 16. So if you got a nice, bright, sunny day and you at f16 and you focus where i what i'm saying here your whole image is going to be in focus from front to back however if you go to f5 it's the same focus point it's you're, you're going to get the the sun in focus and you're going to get everything infinity in focus but that tree is going to be out of focus now at f5 of course as i stated in the earlier slide you're going to you're going to have a faster shutter speed you may require in bright sunlight or ISO to, to correct the, get the correct exposure. At F16, less sliding through the lens, you're going to get slower, a longer shutter speed. You may require a higher ISO to get a shutter that you can work with. So that's kind of a general rule, no matter how you, what you're photographing, the model or, or landscapes, 
Portraits, sometimes you want the, the background out of focus. So for portraits, for instance, you always use a lower, um, lower, uh, a larger lens opening, like f5 or f6, six, something like that. So you get the background blurred out and the foreground, the subject is in focus. Any questions so far? Pipe in. You have to mute yourself if you got a question. Unmute yourself. So far, so good. Okay. Backdrops. Uh, again, now we're talking about not in a show, uh, a show scenario. You can almost give almost anything that gives it a clean, uncluttered background. If the subject is a model, right? Uh, some people, I think I've seen Chris use one of these, a small light box at the edit. Take the model and put it in a light box. And these things are usually lit from the outside. So the light box is kind of translucent and you get the light from the outside, the box shining in. Chris, am I correct there? Shake your head. Yeah, and actually that was John Figueroa that I had borrowed for like a year or so. Yeah, but that's exactly what it was, a little pop-up nylon thing that we lit from the outside. Okay, they, they do work, unless you got a really large model, but you can't get it in the box. Um, you could uh, hang it from a wall or use a tabletop or use a dedicated backdrop support. You can get backdrop supports uh, like b &H Photo or Adorama, and you, you, they come with a variety, or you can get a variety of different backdrops that's for them. Like some of you guys may have that have been to one of the NCMSS shows, the figure shows, you may have seen me doing all the show photos with a, a, a black felt backdrop. Well, that you that's with that standard I told you to buy, and you can get virtually any backdrop you want for it. A lot of people use green screens. They use green screens because kind of a bright green is the ideal color for you to be able to um, erase in Photoshop in one fell swoop, one click, because it's all the same color and it's usually way different from the surrounding, from the subject you're doing. So you can erase it. And for instance, you could take that figure and put it in a, a different setting or a different backdrop. And backdrops, again, backdrops are available digitally. So you can, if you can erase that backdrop that you use at a show, you can put it in front of any backdrop you want. Um, if you're using a black drop, back, black backdrop, like I did the show, be sure to use a velvet one. A regular black cloth, it'll reflect light and it'll just appear dark gray. So invest in a, a, a velour or velvet type uh, backdrop. Okay, enlighten me. This is all about exposure. Uh, the backdrop wasn't, it, it's not supposed to be blue. That's the way it turned out. Check your white balance on the camera. White balance is the true representation of pure white. Uh, depending on the white balance, the camera may be, it may be think it's, thinks it's, it, it's under a different type of lighting. In other words, fluorescence daylight, uh, tungsten lights. Each one will give you that backdrop. If it's white, a different cast. Fluorescent will, it'll, if you have it set on something other than fluorescent light, for instance, and uh, you take it under fluorescence, it's gonna turn out blue. With uh, incandescent, uh, incandescent or tungsten, it's gonna turn out orange. Now, having said that, most cameras can, uh, will pick the white balance. If you put it on auto white balance, it's going to give it its best shot to pick the correct surrounding, the, to get the correct representation of white. Uh, and you can see here, just a, a temperature chart, around 5,500 5, Kelvin is usually the best representation of uh, daylight. Now, when you get down into the higher, uh, Kelvin numbers like 9,000 all the way down to 7,000, that's leaning towards fluorescent. Okay. And finally, warm, the warmer colors, they go for the, they lean towards the incandescent colors. So try to make either you do a test shot to make sure the white is coming out the way you want and fiddle with those white balance settings on the camera to make sure you're getting pure white. Now, once you get it into Photoshop or online, you can usually brighten up that white background, even if it didn't come out exactly right. OK. 
Okay. Mike, are you going to talk about shooting in RAW versus JPEG? Yes. Yes, we're going to get there. Okay. Uh, I think I am, but if not, I'll, I'll, I'll bring that up. Uh, cameras, they have predetermined settings for each type of lighting. You can create a preset. I'm not going to get into how to do that because it's way too much for this presentation. But what it involves basically is the instructions in the manual will, te will tell you how to take a picture of a, just a white background. And that will create a preset that every time you're doing a, 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 a photo in the future against a white background, you can use that preset to be sure you're gonna get um, a, a pure white background. Uh, I said solid white background, you can also use a neutral gray, it will work. Camera shots will have it. In you guys area, Ace Camera and Sterling will have them. But it's really important if you don't want to see a gray background or a blue background, make sure you get your white balance right before you do a photograph for real. Okay, this is a custom, one in the upper left is custom white balance. That's using this preset I told you about. Uh, I've taken test, set the custom setting against a pure white background uh, and that's what I got. Now, if you use that same setting, under daylight setting, this is what you're gonna get. Under fluorescent light, you'll get a blue background. Cloudy day, you'll get this. Dancing in the shadows. Uh, if you're at a show, you might be able to use a tripod, most likely not because somebody's gonna come along and kick it and it'll fall over and you're done. Um, in most cases, ambient light will be okay and you won't have a shadow problem if you're on a tripod. Uh, if you're forced to use a flash, you might have to live with the shadows because any, any kind of external light, as you can see in this photo, depending on where it's coming from, for instance, in this one, it's coming from up here where my uh, cursor is. It's hitting the wing and creating that shadow underneath. But if you were just doing it in natural light, you wouldn't have that problem. And that you could only do probably to show under a tripod. If you can control the conditions, you can use multiple flashes or daylight balance, constant lights. Now, again, going back to the NCMS shows, you guys have seen me use uh, constant lighting. They're uh, daylight balanced uh, incandescent lamps. And you can see because of the way you position it, the lights, you can pretty well eliminate that shadow. You can see a hint of it going on here, right around this area and here, and maybe under the tail a little bit, but it's way reduced from you use a flash, which is just wow, a, a flash of light. Ideal lighting setup. Now I'm, I'm going to explain what I have here, but when I get done explaining it, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what I am currently using, which is not this. Um, cameras in the center, you've got your image frame. Here I have two lights, and this is what you saw me using in NCMSS. The lights, for the rest of the, uh, the constant incandescence are pointing up into an umbrella, and th that umbrella reflected light, the umbrella has a, a uh, foil foil inside coating. So that reflected light is what's light in your image, evenly from both sides. Or you can move them around to get the effect you want. The point is, is that for that foil reflector softens the light. So that takes away some of the shadows. Some people also shoot through, um, um, what's the word na name for it? Uh, the translucent hoods. And I can't remember what that, the official name is, but anybody, Chris, do you got any help there? No, I'm trying to think of what it oh, is. I know what it is, softbox. Oh, softbox. there you go. Yeah, I have one actually. It fits on the flash on my camera. Yeah, and that's going to do the same thing as these reflectors. It's going to soften the image so you don't get as much uh, shadow. Again, it's on a tripod, so you can see I'm using a cable release. Because with the flash, that really wouldn't matter, but with these lights it would because you may have a slow shutter speed and you couldn't handheld a couple of it. Okay, two ways that if you have multiple flashes. Now I have multiple flashes and I have um, the, the constant, the Indian constant light incandescence. Um, I have all that because there's some real estate and portrait photography too, and it depends what the subject is that the system you want to use. Now, if you have a Nikon, they have what they call their creative lighting system. So in that scenario I just showed you, if 
the main flash on the camera fires, that flash, it, it sends out a pre-flash before the main flash that you would, would like to subject with. And that's, that pre-flash sets off the other flashes. You can adjust those slave flashes right from your camera. So the one on the right is too bright, you can drop it down a little bit and so on and so forth. Same with the one on the left. Uh, you can also set the main flash to not affect the image at all. You, you basically turn it off except for the pre-flash that's gonna set off the, the side flashes. So that middle flash will not have any effect on your exposure at all. All the work will be doing by the two ones on the left and right. Um, other lighting systems that for instance use with Canon or, or, or um, maybe Fuji, Sony, they have RF um, triggers. The main flash doesn't have to see the remotes. Uh, they'll fire when the controller sends out a radio signal. Disadvantage, you can't typically control those remotes from, this, from your camera. In other words, if I was using an RF system and I was in a photographing a house and the certain area I was photographing, the upstairs where the other, other lights are was too bright, I'd have to run upstairs to change it. Whereas with the Nikon system, you can control it right from the camera. So I think, I think the latest Nikons, by the way, have gone to, you can have either, either an optical or an RF flash. Can your camera do all of it? Okay. Uh, I will say that most, well, all SLRs, current SLRs, and probably for the last 10 years, 15 years, they can control this kind of multiple flashes and so on. Um, phone cameras, probably not. Uh, point and shoots, probably will. I mean, they're, they're getting better and better. But it all depends on the, on, on the camera. I don't know that much about phone cameras, uh, but I find it, I, I have not come across one yet that can control multiple flashes. You're relying on the flash that's in the phone. That could be good or bad, depending on your application. Okay. Pros and cons about different camera types. Cardboard box camera. That's the old Brooklyn. So you, anybody who's driven up the Belt Parkway heading into Brooklyn, New York, you see that sign on the side. Forget about it. Uh, point and shoot, uh, non-removable lens. They're light though, easily transported if you're going on a trip somewhere. Prosumer or bridge. Uh, these things were popular a couple of years ago. Not so much anymore. I haven't seen much about them. Lens is not removable, but they have a lot of the functions of SLRs. Uh, compact system cameras, they're really coming on strong these days. And they were, they were a niche market five years ago, but there are a lot of people are using it. And interchangeable lenses, just like an SLR, lots of functions just like SLR, but there's no mirror. So you're looking, what you're looking at on that screen in the back is a digitally created image. Whereas with an SLR, you're looking through a series of mirrors through the viewfinder. Um, the disadvantage of these is if you take that lens off and you're in a dusty environment like a beach, uh, a sand is going to get right into that open, open uh, lens area where you attach the lens and the sensor is exposed right then and there. I mean, it's right in front of you. So be very careful. If you get that kind of camera and you're at the beach or something like that, make sure you're in a shielded location before you change the lens. Once that sensor gets damaged, you're done. Uh, of course, everybody knows single lens reflexes. Interchangeable lenses, mirrors are inside and arranged in a certain way that you look, the, what you're seeing in that viewfinder is, is reflected through the lens into a mirror and then up to your, your viewfinder that you, you got your eye against. Um, most current SLRs, you can also switch them to live view. In effect, then they become the same as a compact system camera. You're looking at a digitally created image. Um, the compact systems cameras, they're light, easy to transport, good to take on a trip. Single lens reflex, hard to transport because they're bigger, usually much bigger and heavier. Okay. Well, Chris asked me to get into, I haven't got a slide for that. I ought to add one. But the, uh, the differences between uh, the different formats that you're shooting. In other words, uh, JPEGs, RAWs, uh, those are two, basically two better basic ones. So 
uh, when you, now I think Nikon calls it a raw image. Anybody got a Canon out there? What is Canon, Canon call the equivalent of a raw? Chris, you know? Uh, my cousin shoots Canon. I don't remember what they uh, what the format's called. Um, call you mean the name? I mean, I've got I've got a Canon. It's it's just raw as far as I know. Now, Canon calls it something different, but it's irrelevant. It, it, what I'm going to explain is is applies to both cameras. So, what raw means is almost exactly what the definition of the term is. <clears throat> Excuse me. When you're shooting in raw, that sensor is ca capturing the complete range of tones in the image. Uh, something may appear dark, but if you, in, in, in editing software, you can bring out the detail. By contrast, when you shoot at a JPEG, if you've got a certain exposure set in the camera and that area appears dark in the JPEG, nothing much you can do about it because that's what the camera recorded. Whereas in, if you shoot a raw image, it's all available. The, the, uh, the example I like to use is if you had been standing in front of the Texas Book Depository when Kennedy was shot and you had your camera focused on that window where Oswald was, if you shot in JPEG, that window would look like a black, a black square. However, if you had shot it in raw, when that, of course, there were no digital cameras back then, but if you had shot it with digital camera, taking it in a raw format, you could brighten up that window and most likely see Oswald's face in right from there. That's the best explanation I could give you of it. Uh, where this comes in handy is you may find certain areas of the picture that are dark, a shadow, you wanna brighten it up and bring out the detail, or certain areas that are too dark, you can lighten them up. All the, uh, the photo editing software, Photoshop, uh, Lightroom, they all have raw editors. So when you open up a raw format photo, it will automatically open up in that raw editor and let you adjust all these things, shadows, highlights, a white balance. It's, it's, the list is endless. And when you finally get it the way you want, then you can convert it to a JPEG. The raw image, even if you convert it to a JPEG and save it, that raw image will never change. So you will always be able to go back and alter it. Um, Let's see, anything else on that? Yeah, the ability to go in there and as you were saying, to change different settings, what I find really useful is especially when I'm shooting at a model show, because usually the lighting is terrible, I can I can really change the white balance and, and bring that out as, as necessary and then increase the exposure, decrease the exposure to lighten or darken it as necessary. So it just gives you a lot more ability to manipulate the image without having to fumble with individual settings all the time on the camera. Now I will, you know, I, I will say that, it, that uh, a raw image takes up way more room on the camera memory uh, on your card uh, than just a JPEG. I personally, I personally shoot both. <coughs> the JPEG is, doesn't take up much room. And if I happen to get a perfect shot out of JPEG, that's the one I'll use. But if it isn't perfect, I'll go over to the raw and fiddle with that before I save it as a final JPEG. One final comment on that. Uh, if you're in a situation where there is a lot of light and dark contrast, for instance, in rooms, uh, I could give you a whole nother presentation on, some, on something called uh, high, def high dynamic range photography. And uh, what this boils down to is if you took a, a picture in a room, let's say your kitchen and all the kitchen cabinets, Floor, everything was in great, great exposure, but the window behind the sink was bright, blown out. If you use high dynamic range photography, you can, you'll be able to create an image without going into too much detail. There's a whole other subject uh, that would let you see what was outside that, in, that window. In other words, trees, bushes, sky, and it would all be evenly exposed throughout the whole range, the whole uh, tonal range of the picture. Subject for another time. So let me see, I think that's about it. Okay, any questions? No? Mike, do you have any thoughts on shooting a little further away at a longer focal length or a little closer to a shorter yeah. focal length? Yeah, uh, in that, uh, if you got a controlled situation, you're shooting a picture of a model, that's controllable. If you're shooting a picture of a room or a portrait subject, any of that, that's all controllable. 
you can place, frame the image like you want. Where it becomes tougher are things like sporting events and car shows, air shows. Uh, the things are moving across the sky or around the racetrack really fast. In that scenario, I would recommend shooting it at a, 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 a wider, a wider focal length. So you get the, the, the subject looks smaller in the frame, but with today's resolutions going up as high as they do, you can crop that down and re, resize it. So you're filling the whole frame and lose nothing of the resolution. The reason being, if you've got an airplane coming across the sky and you focus on it at a distance and you filled the frame, that thing's moving so fast that it's very unlikely that you're going to be able to, uh, it's going to be in the same, it's going to be framed the same by the time you get, look at the finished image. That's one of the reasons you see people at air shows all the time with the cameras on, on a continuous release. So you'll see them press the shutter button, follow the airplane across the sky and the camera will be going click, 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 click. You're taking 20 images, the same thing. And hopefully one of them is in right center in the frame. So that's, it's a good question, Patrick. Um, and that's what I would recommend doing, especially, especially at moving subjects. Yep, Mike? Yeah. Bill Sandberg, um, if you remember Lynn, I can't remember his last name, uh, on the board at Chattanooga, um, Lynn goes out to Star Canyon to shoot, uh, you know, the jets going by. Yeah. And yeah. in cases, he says, uh, for moving objects like that, you set your shutter speed, you set your aperture you want, and you float your um, ISO. Yes, you can do that. You can let the camera go. That, that camera allows the ISO. control everything, especially when it's in sunlight. You know, you're not really too concerned about it or even overcast. Well, but you want, uh, you want to shut your speed fast because the airplane is moving fast. Yes, you have to do that. And you want the aperture. Aperture isn't too important at the distance an airplane is. So, so it's, you know, even at F5, the airplane is going to be in focus. But letting it, the camera adjust the ISO will let it adjust the shutter speed up and down uh, and the aperture so that the ISO will determine everything. Right. And in, many, in some cases, you know, he said he wants the background and the aircraft to be in focus. Sure. Yeah. I'm wants to have the blurred background so he would then control his uh, speed. Yeah. Because to get the blur as the aircraft goes by, the jet goes by. If, if you want to, if, if you want to blur, you, you, you pan the camera with, you're panning anyways to stay up with it, right? But, but you'll get a blur if you pan the camera and a slower, a slightly, yeah, slower shutter speed. Yeah, slower. Yeah, you'll get a. It's like taking a picture of a kid on a bicycle drive, going by you. You just follow him, hit it, and you'll have a picture of the kid. Will be in focus and sharp, but the blur of everything behind him will look be more. Yeah. but keep in mind, uh, you know, if it's a bright sunny day and you're up at like three thousandths of a second, which is possible with these cameras, you could have a move. The airplane would be in focus, and so would any moving clouds that, even if they're moving fast, just use it. It's it's a it's a, a balancing act. Between you gotta, ISO, aperture. You got to be careful with the airplanes too. Just what kind of airplane you're shooting. If you're shooting a jet, you can go to very, very high speeds. If you're shooting a prop plane, you Correct. shoot fast. You end up with a frozen prop. Right. And it just looks like a model that's held up in the air. I think I think the max you want for that is probably one two fiftieth at the most. One two fiftieth to one five hundredth will do it. Yeah. No faster than that. Yeah. And believe me, that's fast enough to capture any action. Oh yeah. Especially with a prop plane. Okay. Any hey, other Mike, questions? Mike. Yeah. Mike. Uh, Evan had a question. Uh, he asked, uh, "Do you have an opinion on shooting models outside and uh, avoiding some of the issues with indoor shooting with flash?" Yeah. Um, which is the thing I want. When I was talking about uh, earlier about um, was even he floated off my screen here. Where is he? Oh, there's Jerry. Grab Jerry. Congratulations. Well, to finish off with uh, with Evan's question, there he's, okay. he's the yeah. tank. He's so, got the picture there. So, um, what I forgot to mention, I was talking about. <clears throat> I said I was going to mention, but then it slipped out of my mind. Uh, flash or incandescent lighting. Uh, lately, I have found 
that if I'm in this, for instance, this controlled environment where my, my workroom is here, there's also kind of a little mini photo studio. Um, I'm shooting against a white background. And for the white background, I just use a, a, a pull down window shade, vinyl window shade. It's pure white. I can retract it up underneath the cabinet and until I use it. And I pull it down, lay it flat on the table. Now you got a nice curved surface where it comes from the wall to the flat surface. And I just set the model down, put the camera on a tripod, uh, set the ISO, since it's on a tripod, as low as I want, 100 ISO, 200 maybe, um, and use a cable release, frame it up, and shoot it. If the, if the lens stays open 15, 20 seconds, who cares? It's on a tripod. Uh, the advantage is that with just natural room light, you're not going to get any shadows at all. No, I might have some light coming in from the window on the side of the room over here, but uh, it's minimal. So lately, that's the, the formula I've been using in the house here. Um, outside, it, you know, it can be very varied. You know, if you shoot outdoors, depending on where the sun is, you're going to get some shadows. Um, a cloudy day would be better than a sunny day. If you're going to shoot it outdoors on a table, for instance, that's, does that answer your question? Hello. He gave you a thumbs up. Okay. I don't see him on here. Yeah, he's he's the tank there. He's his picture's up. Okay. But okay. I hope that answers your question, even. Any others? Okay. I'm hey, Mike, have you ever Mike, Sorry. have you ever had the window shade kind of flap up and no, pull, I haven't. pull up with it? <laughs> No, you would you would think of that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was sitting here thinking the exact same thing. That would be my <laughs> luck. Yep. That I would yep. have the best model I ever did in my entire life sitting on that, and it would retract and explode. Yep. The worst, yep. the worst oh. luck, the worst luck with a camera that I can ever recall was poor old Ken Robert. We were at a, <laughs> a original convention, and they hired a photographer to take formal professional photographs of the models that were in, in the contest. And one by one, we'd bring them up to his stand where he had, where he had these four enormous lights to oh, yeah. deal with this issue of, of, uh, of shadow and whatnot. But the lights were generating heat. And so my, uh, Ken brought up, I think it was a P40, a quarter scale P40, and he put it down on the, on the guy's mat. And the guy turned on the lights and left the lights on and was puttering with the with this, uh, the uh, 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 the image and whatnot, the, the, the composition of the picture. And I, I was watching this, I saw this, it's an amazing thing. It didn't just sort of like melt down, it just collapsed inside itself. It's like it, a moment <laughs> was reached where it just wasn't gonna retain its shape anymore. And the model folded up and melted. Yeah, <laughs> which, is why you want, which is why you want to use reflectors or soft boxes. Ken was not happy. <laughs> Jesus, what kind of lights was he using? He was using some hot lights. Yeah, incandescents, basically incandescent photo lamps. 